Friday, the 22nd of January 2021. Good evening, televiewers. You're watching the news. We kick starting Duwala. <laughs> With this, Banlock Polycap and his team of seven members, Baunye Executive, and the entire body of regional councillors for the Little Royal Region officially resumed function. Function in which Cameroonians are expecting them to usher in the realities of decentralization. In his capacity as the representative of the head of state, the regional governor Samuel Jedone Ivaha Diboa highlighted the need for a spirit of teamwork as they carry out their duty. Duties which Cameroonians bestowed upon them based on their experience, aptitude, and competence. Above all, the governor expatiated on the well defined segment of regional authorities differentiated between administrative segment and decentralized territorial collectivity. He called on the entire administrative authorities of the region to give these men and women an enabling environment to carry out their assignment, an assignment which is to ensure a better living condition of the population. From Sanaga Maritime to Mongo, from Kam to Wuri divisions, and so the regional team will begin focusing on priority areas. We are going to see about the road, about electricity, about water supply, about health, about health, and about education. We are going to start all this work immediately. We don't have time to wait. Bearing in mind the cosmopolitan nature of the region, traditional dances from within and beyond the region were at hand to grace the highly attended ceremony. In line to the installations of regional council executive across the national territory, it is important for us to reiterate the role they are to play in the ongoing decentralization process. According to the constitution, each region is managed by a regional council led by a president. The president of the council is the representative of the head of state in the region. Inasmuch as they enjoy administrative and financial autonomy to manage the affairs of the region, they have the duty to promote economic social, sanitary, educational, cultural and sport development in their respective regions. They are equally required to meet the current and future needs of communities for good quality local infrastructure, local public services and performance of regulatory functions in a way that is most cost effective for households and businesses. In all the regional councillors, headed by its president and committee members, prepares long-term plans, annual plans and budget in consultation with their communities to overall improve their well-being and living conditions. The Central African Republic has announced a state of emergency after armed groups tried to block the capital Bangui in a bid to topple newly elected President Faustin Akanj Twadera. The state of emergency has been proclaimed across the national territory for 15 days starting from midnight January 21 until February 4, presidential spokesman Albert Yaloke Mokpeme said over the national radio. Rebels controlling about two-thirds of the Perignali volatile nation launched an offensive a week before presidential elections on December 27, trying to blockade Bangui and carrying out several attacks on key national highways. Tuadera was declared re elected by the Constitutional Court on Monday, though two voters out of three did not cast their ballot, mainly due to insecurity in a country cut up in civil war for eight years. On January 13, the rebels launched two simultaneous attacks attacks on Bangui but were pushed back by MINUSCA which has been present in the country since 2014. The UN envoy to the Central African Republic, Manka Diaye, on Thursday called the Security Council for a substantial increase in the number of peacekeepers 
deployed in the country after recent deadly attacks by armed groups. Congolese members of parliament have this Friday, January 22, cast a vote on their membership that will decide the majority in parliament, but with particular importance to the political rivalry between the pro Joseph Kabila camp and current President Felix Chisekedi. The plenary, which took place at the People's Palace in Kinshasa, will draw the contours of the new majority in the National Assembly after divorce between the camp of President Felix Chisekedi and that of his predecessor, Joseph Kabila. 25 leaders of political groups and parties have joined the sacred alliance of the nation wanted by the head of state according to data presented Thursday by Modest Bayati Lukwebu. There were hundreds of MPs, an overwhelming majority, he concluded. The alliance of democratic forces of Congo chaired by Modest Bayati is the second political force represented in the Congolese National Assembly with 41 seats after the PPRT of former President Joseph Kabila with 52. As of the delivery of this report, the official results were not yet apprehended this Friday. The Congolese MPs will decide whether or not to join the secret union of the nation. Still in Africa, with rising tensions in Uganda, opposition leader Bobby Wine, who is under de facto house arrest by the military, has filed an arbitrary detention complaint to the United Nations against the state. His lawyers were once again blocked from visiting the opposition leader on Thursday. Bobby Wine's residence in Kampala has been surrounded by the army since Friday, a day after Uganda conducted presidential elections in which Bobby Wine competed against President Yuweri Museveni. The state prosecutors presented the court with a sworn affidavit from the Inspector General of Police alleging crimes committed or yet to be committed by Robert Kiagulanhi. Long-time President Museveni, 76-year-old, was re-elected with almost 59% of the vote, followed by 38-year-old Bobby Wine with roughly 35%. The opposition leader says he will legally contest the result of the presidential election alleging widespread fraud during the January 14 poll seen as Uganda's first election in which there was a real threat to Museveni's rule. In a statement, Amnesty International is demanding that the Ugandan authorities immediately lift the police and military search of Wine's home and release him and his wife. COVID-19 authorities in Sierra Leone have announced a new lockdown of the capital Freetown and a night curfew throughout the country to counter the exponential increase of coronavirus cases in the country. In a statement from the Government Center for Response to COVID-19, these measures, like others made public Thursday, will come into effect from Monday, January 25th for two weeks. The authorities have decided to restrict entry and exit from the western area, the territory corresponding to Freetown and its surroundings. A curfew will be re-established throughout the country from 10 p.m. to 5 a.m. local time. Restaurants and bars will have to remain closed on weekends and the wearing of face masks remains mandatory in public places. Sierra Leone has reported 3,081 cases of COVID-19 and 77 deaths since March 2020. Freetown has recorded more than half of the cases of contamination in the country. Travel outside Freetown, considered essential, is subject to a negative COVID test within 72 hours. An electronic pass will be introduced to regulate essential movements, its center said, and it will also be accessible through a mobile application. It is important to note that the British colony of 7.5 million people has once been hard hit by the Ebola pandemic and is still struggling to recover from a civil war that killed thousands of people nearly 20 years after the end of the conflict.
From the African continent, Turkey says it wishes to turn a new page with the European Union after a turbulent 2020 that saw relations between the two deteriorate. The Turkish foreign minister met with EU's foreign affairs chief Joseph Borrell in Brussels, where he expressed his country's desire to get things back on track with the 27-member bloc. Turkey's charm offensive comes after months of difficulties between Ankara and Brussels, with EU leaders agreeing to the use of targeted sanctions at the end of December aimed at punishing the Turkish actors involved in drilling and gas exploration in the East Mediterranean. President Erdogan has also been accused of provoking a delegate situation in northern Cyprus, which is recognized by the international community as being illegally occupied by Turkey. In Thursday's discussion, Ankara was sending out a different message with the country's foreign minister looking to talk about a positive agenda including on migration, visa liberalization and modernization of the customs union talks that have been frozen for some time. Borrell welcomed the Turkish gesture to deactivate the tensions However, saying another good step is the announced resumption of exploratory talks between Turkey and Greece. We strongly wish to see a sustainable de-escalation in the eastern Mediterranean but also in the wider region. United States of America Senate Republican leader Mitch McConnell is proposing to push back the start of Donald Trump's impeachment trial to February to give the former president time to prepare and review his case. House Democrats who voted to impeach Trump last week for inciting the deadly Capitol riots on January 6 have signaled they want to move quickly to the trial as President Joe Biden begins his term saying a full reckoning is necessary before the country and the Congress can move on. But in a statement on Thursday evening, McConnell suggested a more extended timeline that will see the House transmit the article of impeachment next week on January 28, launching the trial's first phase. After that, the Senate will give the President's defense team and House prosecutors two weeks to file briefs. Arguments in the trial will likely begin in mid-February. Democrats who hold a House majority narrowly took control of the Senate on Wednesday, but at least two-thirds of the 100-member body are required to convict Trump. A separate vote will be needed to block him from running for office again. While Republicans have called for a delay to allow Trump to prepare his defense, some Democrats will also favor a delay to help keep Biden's agenda and appointment on track. And twin suicide bombings ripped through a crowded marketplace in Baghdad on Thursday, killing at least 32 people and wounding at least 75 others in first attack in Iraq's capital in more than two years. Islamic State claimed early this Friday that two of its men blew themselves up in Tehran Square in the central of Baghdad, according to a statement posted on the group's Telegram communications channel. Images after the blast showed pools of blood and discarded shoes at the site, a clothing market in the center of the city. Health authorities said at least 110 people had been wounded. Iraqi President Baham Sali condemned the attack, saying in a tweet the two terrorist explosions targeting innocent people in Baghdad and at this specific time confirms the attempt by groups of darkness to target all national entitlements and our people's aspiration for a safe future. Prime Minister Mustafa al kadhimi held an urgent meeting with top security commanders to discuss Thursday's attack and in the call sacked key security and police commanders, Deputy Interior Minister for Intelligence Affairs, Director of Counterterrorism and Intelligence in the Interior Ministry and Commander of Federal Police Forces, said a military spokesman in a statement. Iraqi security forces were deployed 
and key roads blocked to prevent possible further attacks. However, suicide attacks, once an almost daily occurrence in the Iraqi capital, have halted in recent years since Islamic State fighters were defeated in 2017, part of an overall improvement in security that has brought normal life back to Baghdad. Ladies and gentlemen, those were the sessions for today's edition. Thanks for watching. Information continues on DBS Television.